Welcome. I am Rails and so can you. You may or may not recognize this as a reference to Stephen Colbert's I am America and so can you. But what does this really mean? Who am I and why do you actually care? Well, I'm here to tell you about how we get more women into coding. A lot of this advice may ultimately be applicable to other groups that we don't see represented well in programming right now, but I am a woman and therefore I'm going to speak to my experience and what I'm most familiar with. So I'm going to tell you first about my experiences learning to code. I taught myself to program in the year 2011, so I've only been programming for a year and a half. Um, I'm going to also talk about the lessons that I've learned from coaching at Rails Girls here in Berlin. And I'm going to talk also about some of the things I've learned from places like Harvey Mudd College, um, some changes that they made to their CS curriculum that are really interesting and, and valuable. So this is 2011. I learned to code and got a programming job in under a year. And it's, it's significant. It, uh, so. But I didn't come from a programming background. I used to be a professional stage manager for live theater. And that has a lot more in common with project management than it does with, uh, with programming. But now I'm a developer at Media Peers here in Berlin, and I coach with Rails Girls Berlin. Media Peers is a startup here. We do business to business software as a service for companies that produce and, and license film and television content. So you know the company that makes the movie says, hey, we want to pay you money to host our, our programming so that we can sell it to customers more easily. And the customers get use of our software for free, making it attractive for the people selling things. So um, I do both both front-end development there with uh, HTML, CSS, a little bit of jQuery stuff, um, but I also do back-end development in Ruby on Rails. So what is Rails Girls, you may ask? Well, it's a project to get women coding who haven't been coding before. Um, it's usually a two-day process uh, with an installation party, usually on a Friday night, and a workshop on Saturday all day. And the workshop contains talks introducing programming concepts, uh, introducing sometimes actual uh, programming things, you know, walk through uh, Try Ruby, for instance, uh, and also b building an app in small groups, uh, working to do that and really having something that you can show off by the end of the day. Um, some participants in Rails Girls' uh, first workshop here have started a local chapter. That is what Rails Girls Berlin is. Um, so I am Rails. I am not Rails Girls. There are a few differences here that you may wish to note. Um, I've had some confusion on this point before. Um, I am from St. Paul, Minnesota in the US. Rails Girls was founded in Helsinki, Finland. I followed a tutorial, they wrote a tutorial. I did my first workshop with Rails Girls in April of this year. Rails Girls was uh, doing their first workshop in 2010 before I'd even picked up programming. Um, and I am international due to motivated self-interest, as I like to say. Uh, my husband is originally from Berlin, and Rails Girls is international due to popular demand. They're doing workshops in Tokyo and Buenos Aires and all over the place. So. Yeah, they're, they're a little more popular than I am, and I'm okay with that. Um, so Rails Girls and Rails Girls Berlin, also a little bit of confusion there sometimes. Um, Rails Girls is a global thing based in Finland, and they organized the first workshop here in Berlin in April. Um, and then Rails Girls Berlin was organized by people who went to that first workshop and were so excited that they wanted to bring it to other people and they wanted to keep programming themselves. They wanted to just keep rolling with the excitement that they had out of this project. And so they organized all of the subsequent workshops that we've had here in Berlin. So calendar year 2011. The end of January, I picked up Ruby for the first time. I started with Try Ruby. I tried Rails for Zombies. Um, I even wrote a little Sinatra app called Yo Dog, which you can find on my GitHub profile at uh, Joan Wolk on GitHub. And uh, you can also play with it at yodog.heroku.com. That's D A W G because it's that meme, yes. Um, and you can change what it says. You can say you know, in the URL that you want it to have pants. And so then it will say, yo dog, I heard you like pants. And I put some pants in your pants so you can pants while you pants. Uh, it was very silly, but it taught me a few things. But it was still, it wasn't quite what I needed. I wanted something more thorough because Rails for Zombies, you know, fun though it is, I didn't really feel like I understood what I'd done at the end of this project. Um, and so then I found the Rails tutorial by Michael Hartle, and I started that in the middle of February. 
Michael Hartle, if I ever meet you in person, I owe you so many beers. Um, he released this book online for free, among other licenses, under the Beerware license. And if you think it's worthwhile, then you should buy him a beer. So I totally, totally will. Um, but I also found a lot of help on Stack Overflow when I was uh, searching for answers if I got stuck working through the book. But for the most part, the Rails tutorial book is extremely thorough and it's really good for, for everybody at all different levels. It's got enough low-level explanation for beginners, but it's got enough you know, really technical detail for people who are programmers in other languages coming to Rails for the first time. So I love the Rails tutorial and I will just... I will spout all day how much I love it, but Michael Hartle has not paid me anything to say that. I just think he's awesome. Um, I did also have some more abstract discussions of programming with my husband, who is a programmer, um, but he didn't know Rails at the time, so when he later picked it up, I was actually teaching him things. Anyway, um, while I was still working through this tutorial in April, uh, my husband's friend from the university came to me and said, hey, I'm, I'm entering this contest for fashion designers, and my, my website really needs an overhaul. Um, can, you, can you help me out with that? And so I took sort of a month to work with her on totally redesigning her website because it had been this, uh, which was a bitmap for the, for the links over a table of JPEGs from a Photoshop design. And that was completely unmaintainable. And so she paid me in Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, Thin Mint Girl Scout cookies, and red wine. But I got a lot of experience out of this, and I think it was a good—it was actually a good trade. It was my first project, but it taught me a lot about working with a client and the kind of communication you need to do with a client. Uh, and I got to practice the basics of setting up a Ruby on Rails site. I think it was a really good deal for both of us. And in the end, I think I did a pretty good job of making it not polka dotted. <laughs> um, and so I took a month, worked on this site, and then kept going back with the Rails tutorial, and at the end of May went to Yuruko, uh, which was here in Berlin that year. Uh, my friend Alex convinced me that I should really go to this conference, and I was all, oh, I don't know. I, I don't know programming really that well yet. What am I going to get out of it? And he said, it's going to be a lot of fun. You don't have to understand everything that's happening there in order to have fun there, and you'll meet some really great people. And he was absolutely right. Uh, I got to give Matt's directions on how to get back to Alexanderplatz from the conference location, and I felt really cool about that because Matt's is really cool. Um, and I also met uh, some other people who were really fascinating and interesting, including uh, Robin, who works with Upstream Agile here in Berlin. And that led to me getting an internship with them uh, that started in July. And I worked with them for three months. That's uh, also coincidentally, the beginning of July is when I made the final commits to the Rails tutorial book project. Um, I finished it up. And so that was about four and a half months, including the month that I was mostly working on a different site as uh, for a friend. And while I was interning at Upstream Agile, I worked on three different apps for their Cobot uh, co-working application software. I made an app directory for them, and then I worked on two of the apps that are in that app directory, uh, one for automatically expiring day passes that had been purchased too far in the past, and one for uh, quick charges, one-time charges being made by various spaces, in uh, users in various spaces. Um, and this was a really great experience for me because I learned a lot of things that I wouldn't have learned otherwise. They pushed me to take on technologies that they knew I could handle, but I wouldn't have thought about being able to handle on my own. So I picked up Cucumber, which I wouldn't have used because, you know, that's, that's for working with clients. And I wasn't working with clients, right? But um, my, my slides just went to sleep. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so they, they pushed me to work with Cucumber, and I learned about OAuth, and I learned about a bunch of different things that were really interesting and exciting uh, to, to work with. I worked with cron jobs, and it was all really quite cool. So, hmm, my display is dead over here for some reason, but I'll just try to look at what you guys can see. So. Yeah, I finished my internship at the end of September, and then a month later, I started working at Media Peers, which brings me back to the present day. Um, well, almost the present day, in that I started my, my position with them then, and in 2012, I started coaching with Rails Girls. So, what have I learned from coaching? 
what, that I didn't learn from, from teaching myself? Well, number one, vocabulary is really, really, really hard. Um, it's really hard to remember, uh, especially if you've been programming for a long time, that not all the words that you are using as a definition make sense to people who aren't programmers already. So somebody says, what's Git? And you say, oh, it's a distributed version control system. Huh? No, like, yes, we just had to talk about how, what is Git and how to use it, but that was a half hour discussion just on what is Git and how to use it. You know, you can't just say distributed version control and have that make sense to somebody who's new here. Um, so how do you explain version control, let alone what distributed version control means? Well, you start with the basics and you start by using a metaphor. You say, Git is like a photo album and a commit is like a snapshot and it's sort of magic in that you can point at any snapshot in your album and say I want to go back to when the world looked like that. Does it lose some of the technical details? Sure, but it really really helps people get a mental model, get their brain around it and that's one of the most important things you can do with teaching is give somebody enough information that they can absorb more later. So uh, here we have a bento box model that uh, Linda Lucas from Rails Girls put together. It's, you know, it simplifies, but it helps people sort of understand, get their brains around it. This is showing you know, where do Ruby, and Ruby on Rails and HTML and Unicorn and Apache, where do all these things fit? You know, there are three basic sections on this diagram that unfortunately doesn't show up very well. But the, you know, on the right, there's one set of stuff for the back end, the infrastructure. You know, what is, what is your website really running on, on the hardware side of side? And then the logic of, of the back end in Python or Rails or whatever, you know, that's one section. And then CSS and HTML, those things get grouped together in another section. And it really it helps people see that in a way that makes it less intimidating. So we're working on getting a working mental model first and then you can explain more details later because once you have that grounding, then you can ask for more details. And it feels better to ask for more details instead of fewer. If somebody says, you know, somebody, we had a, we had a question once of you, what's an object? Well, you, know, you can give the, the programming explanation of what's an object in object-oriented programming, but I could see that it, the answer went right over this person's head. And they made that face where you're like, okay, and, and somebody else tried to explain it again and the face was still there. But I could also see that nobody else was going to try to explain it again and nobody else was going to ask again because they were all afraid to ask. And so I went to the really basic metaphor and I said, an object is like a noun. It is a thing in the world. You can poke it. And a method is how you poke it. That's, it's a verb. You know, you have objects and, and methods. You have nouns and verbs. And Yes, there's more technical detail there, but it's not that important right now. So the, one of the other things is that environment is really important for how people feel when they're learning new things. So it's good to keep the groups as small as possible here. Um, the more people you have, the less attention anybody gets from a coach, and the less good people are likely to feel about asking questions in the first place. Um, it's good to form groups roughly by skill level, but that's not as hard as it sounds. Uh, the, gr the skill level can be very broad, you know, and it can be, because we're working with beginners, the skill level might be, I've never heard of programming languages before, I don't know anything about anything, uh, but I'm curious and I want to learn more. And another could be, I know what an HTML tag is. And another could be, I work with a bunch of techies and I hear them use words all the time and I don't know what they mean, but I want to find out. Those would be three basic skill groups to group into. And, um, and then we, one of the things that those two things both contribute to is they make it easier to ask any question that you might have. They make you feel safe and not stupid when you ask a question. And that's really crucial. Um, it's also the coach's job to make people feel safe in asking a question. And that's important too. Attendance at, at Rails Girls has been social as I see it. Um, in my experience, all of the women that I've met have either worked in tech, at, um, in like tech companies, but not as programmers uh, themselves, or they have a partner who is in the tech field. Um, so there's a dorky picture of me and my husband on our wedding day there, um, because even I fall into that category. I am somebody with a programming partner, and. I want to be able to fix this, but I don't know how. I think, I think that there are people out there who don't have programmer friends or, or significant others who would be happy to learn about this, but 
we aren't reaching them. And part of it is that we don't have the reach to, to find those people that we don't know. And part of it is that it's not until you have those people in the field supporting you and telling you that you can do it that you're likely to feel good enough to want to actually try. Um, I think that's part of the reason that we don't see as many women studying computer science um, and programming when they're younger is because they don't have that, they don't feel secure in it and they don't feel supported in that field. So it's when they find that support later, then they come to our program or they teach themselves or whatever. Anyway, progress is key for beginners. Really feeling like you've made progress is huge. Um, so we have here an image from the Idea app that Rails Girls produces. Uh, it's got you know three fields. You can put in a name of an idea, a description of that idea, and out of the frame there, you can put an image as well. And yeah, it's simple, it's straightforward. We style it with Twitter Bootstrap, but it's theirs, and they can show it off to people. They can even post it on the web, maybe. Um, so it's really, it's really important for them to see that something has happened. They were able to accomplish something in programming. It's not just this abstract set of ideas that somebody showed them and said, now go off and do it yourselves. They can do it. They've seen it. And you know, we do use scaffolds to make this happen faster, but it's important to, to see how these things can come together really fast. Um, it's also interesting that Heroku deployment is actually hard for some of these workshops because we don't always use Git in these workshops. That's one more thing to have to explain and to have to get people to set up, and it's not always that easy and fast if what you're trying to accomplish is time limited here. Um, so we've looked a little bit into alternate deployments. Um, Engine Yard is free for a demo, but really expensive later. Um, someone has mentioned Dot Cloud to me, but I haven't had time to look into that more yet. Um, but it's worthwhile when we can get stuff posted to Heroku because then it really can be showed off to all their friends who didn't show up that day. It's really easy and exciting. Follow up. Follow-up is awesome when people want to keep doing things after our initial workshops. So this is, a, this is a picture that someone made showing actually how to get involved with a follow-up project group, uh, you, inspired with the cartoon foxes from Wise Poignant Guide. Um, and some people, some people aren't going to follow up. Some people are just there to get enough vocabulary to talk to their development team. And you know what? That's OK. I support those people. And maybe uh, later on, they will decide to come back. But we've done something important for them, because they can communicate better with the people that they work with. Um, some people will create project groups themselves, will create you know, whole movements, follow-ups to Rails Girls. Uh, here in Berlin, we have the whole pro you know, chapter hosting multiple workshops. That's all people who attended who were just that excited about it. Um, there's also a mailing list, and people, you know, they set up project groups. And that's where the other kind of follow-up comes in, which is the people who join the mailing list and you know, follow what gets said there and join some of the project groups, but don't set them up themselves. And that all works together, and it's pretty great. Preferences for learning are personal. Not everyone wants to learn the same way. And we can't address all of those needs necessarily in one workshop, but we need to be aware of them and think about you know, how can we serve everybody who needs you know, different things to learn. So some people really love books, you know, static sets of instructions. I really loved the Rails tutorial book, but I've recommended it to some of my friends. And some of them said, it doesn't quite you know, work for me. You know, what about something, something different? Um, some people are looking for something more like Codecademy, where it's interactive and you get instant feedback about whether or not you did it right. Um, some people are looking for video tutorials to have you know, a face, you know, somebody talking to them. Uh, some people are really looking for live human interaction. And everybody, you know, everybody likes live human interaction. You want to see some humans, um, talk to them, get feedback on questions in real time. But some people need it more than others and, and won't keep going unless they've got somebody to sit down with and really work with them on a more individual basis. Um, but some things, some things really are universal. Um, and one of those things is that the way we teach people matters. Um, Harvey Mudd College in 2006 changed their computer science curriculum. Um, for some background, Harvey Mudd College is a very small, technically focused college. Uh, they have no humanities majors whatsoever. Um, and they, uh, all of their incoming students have to take computer science. 
And up until then, it had been one class, the same class that everybody got, and it was focused basically on people who had some exposure to computer science, which is like, which is like most computer science 101 classes, frankly. Um, and they changed that. They, uh, they changed it to be two different introductory courses, one for people with previous computer science exposure and one for people without. And just that simple change had the huge impact that you can sort of see on the graph if you can read it. Um, <laughs> It had a huge uptick in the number of women who were uh, computer science majors and who stayed with that and did more coursework in it. And they also had an uptick in the number of men because women aren't the only people who are feeling talked d down to, condescended to, unwelcome in as new new students in a computer science course. There, you know, there are people who didn't have enough, you know, monetary resources to be able to play with computers when they were in high school. They, there are people who, for whatever reason, did not feel encouraged or supported in checking out computers. And so then when they got to college, this, they were already, it was already too late. And that's stupid. It shouldn't be too late. College is supposed to be a time when you can find what it is that you're really looking for to do and what you want to do later on in life. Um, so... We need to teach people at an appropriate level and make them feel safe asking any question, not make them feel stupid and behind when we're giving them the introductory course. Um, role models that students can identify with are really important. This is the president of Harvey Mudd College, Dr. Maria Clava. Um, she became president in 2005 and was really interested in changing the computer science curriculum. She is herself a, a PhD in computer science and I believe also in, also in mathematics. Um, she's really smart and, and uh, is a great role model for the students at Harvey Mudd. Additionally, they started having uh, annual trips for the female computer science students, well, the female students um, who are first years particularly, to go to the Grace Hopper celebration of women in computing. And that is often used by colleges and universities as a retention tool for women who are later in their, in their computer science career, maybe juniors or seniors who are feeling burnt out. Uh, master's students who are not sure if they want to move on with their PhD, they go to this conference and they see all these women doing interesting things in computing and they stick with it. So Harvey Mudd looked at this and said, why can't we use this as a recruitment tool? Show young women what they can do in computer science so that they get interested in the first place. Why wait? And that's been, they've gotten a lot of positive feedback from their students about that as well. And hands-on experiences are also really great. Um, Harvey Mudd College has instituted um, research positions for female students between their first and second year of, of college. And those can be a number of different things. They can be you know, building robots, or they could be, they've had one project of building exercise games for senior citizens uh, through, uh, through a Google summer of code, I think. Um, and so there's all sorts of things that these women get to do that you know, somebody is pushing them and saying, look what you can do. You've already got the skills for this after one introductory computer science course. It's because all it takes is, you know, th you know, using your brain, like it says over there, if you have a brain, you are a startup. You can, you can do all sorts of things. Um, so then we get to the part where I talk about how stereotypes really suck. Um, this is the part where I point out that the stereotypes about women in computer science are just broken. Um, stereotypes are usually broken, but they're particularly bad and insidious in the case of computer science. Um, the idea of the antisocial male programmer was literally built in the 1960s because originally uh, managers looked at programming, this task where you punch a bunch of cards and stick them in a slot. Uh, they said, that looks like secretarial work. So programming must be a women's job. And it was only later on that they realized, actually, there's a lot of brain power involved here. We better take this back and make it a man's job again. And so they, they didn't actually push out the women who were already in the field, but they made it a lot harder for new women to enter the field. They instituted a couple of different um, aptitude tests, one of which was mathematical aptitude. And that one was biased a little bit in that women were much less likely to have um, advanced math courses in college because that was just how the 50s and 60s were. Uh, so that's a little bit biased. But what was really biased about the math exams was that the answer keys were available to men's only groups like the Elks Club. So guys could just study the answers. They could cheat their way through the exam. And additionally, they instituted a personality profile. And guess what was in that personality profile? Your typical programmer should basically be a white collar male office worker, except a little more antisocial. 
they literally built the stereotype and it's terrible it's bad for everybody because programming you, you need to think logically, but you also need to interact with other people to figure out how to build your software. You need to talk to people about the requirements. You need to talk to people about why what they think about the requirements is wrong. You know, you need to talk to people all the time. You need to work with your team. It's, yes, um, I will try not to be too ranty about this. Uh, talk to me more later if you want to hear me rant on this further. Anyway, stereotypes suck, and I bet you didn't know that women lead the use of a bunch of technologies. Internet use, mobile phone voice, mobile phone uh, location services, text messaging, Skype, every social network except LinkedIn, which is telling, uh, all internet-enabled devices, e-readers, healthcare devices, and GPS, all used most by women. And not just young women, actually, but women in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. That's right, your moms are actually using the internet more than you. So keep in mind that women are actually major users of any successful service. Um, they're, you know, they're using Facebook more than most of us. They're, you know, women are important users, so you want to have women working on your product and help you think about what is it that women might want out of this product. You want a diverse team so that you get diverse ideas about what makes a good product. Um, thank you. Are there any questions? Hi. I think it's a great thing what you do, but uh, have you thought about starting earlier, like working with schools already, like to motivate uh, girls or, or, I mean, in general, younger people to program and not wait until they want to, I mean, get interest? Yeah. Um, I think that would be a great thing to do. Um, I have only been doing this for a year and a half myself, so, and I've only started giving talks like this you know, a few months ago, so I haven't gotten to the point of, of advocating that schools change their, uh, change their curriculums just yet, but I think ultimately it is a good idea, and uh, we do need to be preparing younger students for computer science ideas, and yeah. Hi. Um, do you have to, uh, do you need to be a woman to be on rails? I mean, uh, one year ago, I was like you, but I, I didn't be on rails, I be on Arduino. And if I have the opportunity uh, in a space like the women on rails, it, be, uh, it will be better for me understood uh, all the sentence, uh, all, all, you know, all the stuff for programming. Uh, my question is, uh, if I am a man, I can be there also? If, if you are a man, can you be what also? On rails with the women. Uh, yes, um, we, have, we have male coaches for the Rails Girls um, stuff. You can also coach what it is that you know. Um, you said you, that you do Arduino hacking. Um, I've actually heard great things about uh, using Arduinos for, for hacking, for teaching women hacking, but particularly using conductive threads and sewing them into clothing and, and making that relevant to people who wouldn't otherwise think about programming, you know, in, and particularly wouldn't think about hardware programming, but you say, oh, all you have to do is stitch this conductive thread together from here to here, and then you have a shirt that blinks in a pattern, for instance. So you can, you can always teach people about your own technology, too. Maybe maybe one more or one more question? Anyone? Okay. Well, um, it seems that's all. So thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of campus party. Thank you, Joe.